welcome to Techlix. This video is part of a series which charts our attempt to make a smart boy which takes measurements about the sea in just three weeks. In this episode, we're going to be showing you how we made the casing for the buoy, put it together and decided where to put it. When designing the buoy, we had a couple of key things in mind. It needs to fit all the electronics inside, have slots for the solar panels, radio aerial and water temperature sensor. It would also need to be watertight and float, obviously. It also needs an anchor point so it doesn't just float away. We used Autodesk Fusion 360 software to design the buoy. Here's a brief video of our design process. There are a couple of bits where we go back and change things, so bear with us. When deciding we wanted to make our own buoy instead of buying one and adapting it for our purpose, we realised we were going to have a lot of issues. The main one is probably strength. It's going to be in the sea. Waterproofing was also an issue. Basically, all our problems came from the fact it was going to be in the sea. The sea. The sea. The sea. The boys available in the market are very durable and very watertight, as you would expect when you're paying top dollar. However, our project wanted to find a cheaper alternative to this tech, so I guess we chose the hard way. Asking online in the r slash maker forum, big thanks to DB Cottonhead, who gave us some tips about how to make a 3D print durable, waterproof and long-lasting when exposed to the sea. We know PLA doesn't last well in the sun and isn't very strong, probably not ideal for the Caribbean Sea, so we chose to use PETG instead. After a couple of small test prints, we attempted to print the buoy. We used a layer height of 0.3 millimeters and had four perimeters with 15% infill. We press print and hope for the best. Each half took about 24 hours to print and used about 500 grams of filament. They actually came out pretty well, except for a couple of bad starts, some stringiness and some little blobs, which are an expected consequence of printing in PETG using an FDM printer. After clearing out the support material and getting rid of as much of the stringy stuff as possible, we were left with something that looks like this. We can see a few areas where the layers haven't adhered properly, which screams, this will not be watertight. No matter, we've got some post-processing up our sleeves. Our quest for waterproof began with some sanding. After this, we used a couple of coats of plastic filler primer and it came out like this. We can still see that some of the gaps haven't been filled. So our final attempt at waterproof was a layer of epoxy resin. Hopefully, the buoy is now waterproof. We've printed another one in case of tragedy and have replacement parts for everything. We also didn't want to put all the electronics in as a sort of bundled mess of wires. So we've tried to put everything on some perfboard. This is the buoy in its almost completed form. This is the main circuit board where we've put all the electronics. We've had to add an I2C multiplexer on the real-time clock to change its I2C address which clashed with the MP6050. We also removed the SD card module because it was causing massive headaches with the Arduino's memory. You can check out the full code and schematic in the description. But I'll show you through some of the files quickly now. This is the whole smart boy code. First, we define a measurement struct which will store different types of values. 
We will have two different measurement structs to store the information that we collect from the sensors on the buoy and then send using the radio module. Then we define the I2C address of the I2C multiplexer, as well as a function which allows us to select which I2C address the multiplexer uses. Then in the setup, we set up each individual sensor, the GPS, the radio, GY86, accelerometer, gyroscope, barometer, magnetometer, and power control, current and voltage monitor, and the water temperature sensor. We have the SD part commented out due to problems with memory. Then in the loop, we get the GPS data, then the wave measurements and water temperature, and then set a new alarm based on the power measurements. We send the data and then turn the system off. It will remain off until the alarm triggers the system to turn back on. In the GPS file, we do as described in episode 2. The only difference is that in the get GPS data function, we wait a longer period of time and separate the latitude, longitude, time and date. If we find a valid GPS position, time and date, then we can finish the loop early and continue to the next step. In the GY86 file, we make sure to change the multiplexer to use the GY86 output. Then we get barometer readings to determine wave height and then use the wave height to try and work out the wave period. And finally, we use both wave height and period to get an estimate for average wave energy. In the water temperature file, we simply get the temperature measurements from the sensor, just like in episode one. In the radio file, we do the same as in episode two of the series and the send data function sends the two measurement structs we defined earlier. In the power control file, we set up just like is shown in episode three and the same methods are used for the other functions too. The only difference is that the TCA select function, which changes the I2C address we use on the multiplexer to talk to the real time clock. We glued the solar panels in place and put the aerial through the top and the water sensor through the bottom. If any water does get into the buoy, it will probably fry the electronics and we'll just have to cry. But I guess it's the risk we're gonna have to take. To give the buoy stable buoyancy, we've added these floats. To anchor the buoy, we tied a knot around the anchor point on the buoy. Not a fancy knot, but we have it on good authority that it would hold a boat. We left the long bit of rope free so we could tie it to wherever we wanted. Which leads us to the next challenge. Where do you put it? There are lots of things to think about here. You want somewhere it's not going to get smashed on rocks or by massive waves, but somewhere interesting enough that the measurements can tell you something useful. We didn't want to put it too far out because we might want to go out to check on it or readjust and calibrate. But equally, we don't want to put it too close to the shore that measurements are confounded by breaking waves. Ideally, it also wouldn't get stolen by a rogue fishermen. And do you need permission to put something in the sea? Who do you get permission from? The government? But bureaucracy takes so long. Really, it's a bit of a pickle. So we just decided to go with it. One of our Grenadian pals came through and said that we could tie the boy to an existing underwater structure that he had if we couldn't find any anywhere else. So I guess it turns out the old age old saying is true. It's not what you know, it's who you know. But before we get ahead of ourselves and put a pile of electronics in the middle of a vast ocean, we decided to take baby steps and start in the pool. This was definitely a good idea and it acted as a great test location for things like waterproofing and to check the sensors worked as expected. A few moments later. We did a couple of inelegant dive bombs to see how the boy would cope with larger waves from multiple directions.
You need to set up your Raspberry Pi with the latest copy of Raspbian. Connect the radio module like in this diagram, and then SSH into the Pi. Once in, you should check that you have Python 3 installed like this. If you haven't, there are some links below showing you how to. Then you need to install MongoDB. We'll use this to store our measurements as they come in. Install it like this, and then start it like this. Once inside, create a DB. Then create the boy measurements collection. Now, download the code from our GitLab repo. We've already done this. Then, edit the file inside the client folder called env.json with your Pi's IP address and a Google Maps API key. Then build your front-end app. This puts the build into the server folder where it can be served by a Flask app. The app reads messages from the radio module and sends them to the web app, as well as storing them in the Mongo database. To start the app, you must install the environment using pip env. Then run the app file. Once the app is running, you can go to the IP address of the Pi on port 5000 in a browser and see your lovely web app. The measurements are being made in real time. Also check out the story on this page. And finally, once you have a decent amount of results in your database, you can look for trends using this graphing tool. Sadly, this brings us to the end of our smart boy journey. We've had so much fun building it and we're hopeful that in future we can revisit this project and refine it. If we'd had more time, we would have loved to analyse the results and investigate further, but unfortunately we had to leave beautiful Grenada behind. If you've enjoyed our series or even felt inspired by it, please let us know. And a massive shout out to all the people who have come forward to offer advice, shown interest and who have sponsored us on Patreon. We do this because we love it and we hope you've enjoyed it too. Thanks for watching. <laughs>